Estados Unidos by way of OC, Los Angeles and the West Coast. Coming to you, repping Califas, knocking out agendas of the cancel culture and 50 cracks, breaking down doors in Hollywood for La Raza. Thank you for stopping in. We have a special guest today. But before we get to Mike, please take a second to subscribe, like, and please share this video all over from Facebook, Instagram. Help us get the word out. So we have Michael Gonzalez today, also known as Second Chance. Mike, welcome. Welcome. Hey, well, Hi. All right, Paul. How are you, man? How's everything going? Good, man. Before we get going, do you have anything you want to say to all your fans and all the people who may be hearing of you for the first time? Yeah, man. If you're out there, God bless you guys. It's your boy, Second Chance. Um, share and repost this video. Um, it's been a long, long time since I did a personal interview. And, um, you know, I'm just like excited. I'm ready. And uh, it's an honor to be here today. And uh, make sure you guys share it, man. There's a lot of people out there that need to hear this message, um, the story, a lot of information. So God bless you. Yeah. So so me and Mike been friends for a while. And uh, just to give you a, a quick update, um, obviously, for those of you who don't know, Mike is a recording artist. He's very well known across the United States, and I'm sure in different countries. He's also an actor. But... Uh, He's also in, you know, one of the stars in one of my films. He plays Nico Velasquez in one of the films uh, called Kilroy. So we're going to be talking about that later. We're going to be talking about his music career. But for those of you who know Second Chance and been following him for a long time, he has a huge following. I want to ask the questions that probably nobody's going to ask that we get to know this guy. Like, who is Second Chance? Who is Michael Gonzalez? So without further ado, Mike. Here comes the tough questions, brother. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> hey, bro. So we, everybody, we want to know where were you born and how did you grow up as a kid, like a young kid? Man, uh, I was born in a little city southeast of uh, Los Angeles called Artesia. And a lot of people are like, well, where's that at? It's uh, right by uh, on the outskirts of Norwalk, Hawaiian Gardens. And um, I was born and raised there in at Pioneer Hospital, and uh, that hospital is not there anymore, but um, there was a little hospital there. Um, that's where I was uh, raised. That's where um, my 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 whole life resided there for many, many years, and um, that's where the old stomping grounds are, man. And um, uh, I drive by there sometimes, man, and I miss that hospital because it's not there no more, you know? And uh, uh, very few people that I know were born at Pioneer Hospital in Artesia. Yeah, or California. <laughs> yeah, man. Like I like I told you earlier, I was born at that hospital. Right, so right. Born there, man. I guess I guess that makes me old, bro. Because that hospital <laughs> for a while. No, we we ain't that old, man. But I know, man. There's just like I never met anybody, man, besides you that was born in the uh, and in Artesia, California. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Man. And 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 it, it's a it's a blessing to say that, man, because that's where. Um, I was born and raised, you know? Yeah. Tell us about your, your childhood as a kid, as a youngster, elementary days. Like, how did you grow up? Man, you know, uh, I grew up, man, in a, in a, a nice, nice uh, neighborhood. You know, um, a lot of people know that area, Artesia, Cerritos area. It's, it's pretty nice, man. It's a, it's a nice area. I was super blessed because um, growing up as a, as a kid, you know, um, I always had, you know, good, good providers, man. My dad was a good provider. He worked hard. Um, my mom took good care of us and, um, elementary school was good, man. Kindergarten, first, second, third grade. Um, it was, uh, it was awesome, man. It was awesome to, to walk to school, to experience, you know, what, what kids experience, you know what I mean? And, um, I could say that uh, my elementary days were good. And uh, between the fifth and sixth grade, that's when it started kind of everything started sliding for me a little bit, you know, a little curiosity, a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, uh, enticement, you know, things that were temptation, different things that um, I wanted to be a part of, you know? Yeah, Mike, I, I totally get get what you're talking about. And 
So you're growing up, good kid, going to school, loving school, loving your neighborhood, loving everything. What, what was the thing that changed that started taking you down that wrong road? What did you see? Who did you see? And also, like, how did you get enticed to that? I'm saying that because there's kids watching who maybe, you know, could avoid that too. Well, I could say this, man. Um, um, my mom was a good mother. My dad was a good father. But there was a lot of drinking in my home. Um, my my dad loved to drink, and when he drank, um, you know, he would um, uh, beat my mom. And <clears throat> as a kid, I would see this man, and um, I was kind of like, you know, traumatized me and my sister. It was only me and my sister. Um, I only have one sister, and she's uh, three years older than me. And um, I remember, man, she would take the lashes for me, man. She would like when when things would happen. Um, my mom and dad would argue. My dad would fight and 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 hit my mom. And um, my grandparents, my my dad's parents, they lived down the street from us. So anytime that would happen, they would race over. And um, so I would say about fifth or sixth grade, it started getting rocky. You know, my dad, um, I watched my dad a lot. I used to go out with him a lot. Um, he used to kind of, you know, venture out, do his thing. And uh, his cover up, uh, I guess, to tell my mom, you know, was to take me with him. You know what I mean? And um, I would see him, you know, partying, drinking. And um, so, uh, you know, their marriage started to get rocky. And I can see that uh, maybe fifth or sixth grade. And I had a friend, man. I had a, uh, one of my best friends uh, in elementary school. Um, I believe we're fifth or sixth grade. And I remember one day, man, he came to school and um, he had a black eye and stuff. And I was concerned. And I told him, hey, bro, what, what happened, man? You know, and he goes, man, you know what? I got jumped into to the gang. I got jumped into Artesia. And his little brother went there, too. And, um, you know, we were just kind of like, what? You know, like... Um, I could say that was the beginning. Like, uh, I wanted to be a part of that because now my best friend was part of a gang. So I was like, man, you know, like I was uh, kind of interested in like what that lifestyle brought because my dad um, always protected me from that lifestyle. And my dad was an OG. And um, so at that time, my mom and dad would fight a lot. They got divorced. And when I was 10, and so when they got divorced, um, my <clears throat> my mom, she couldn't handle me and my sister because, you know, we were like, we wanted to go with grandma and grandpa because my grandma gave us the freedom and the liberty to kind of do whatever we wanted. You know what I mean? So we would run from my mom's pad to my grandma's. And once again, that was my dad's mom and dad. And, um, you know, that's when I could see things just kind of, you know, unraveling little by little. Um my dad um, always told me that, um, you know, you know, if I was going to go to the neighborhood, if I was going to get jumped in, um, you know, never to hide it from him, because if he found out he was going to, you know, he was going to whip my butt, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, I always, you know, hid it from him. I would go to elementary school and we would start ditching class, we would start ditching school and, um, you know, little by little hanging out with these guys, man. <clears throat> and my dad. Um, you know, he told a lot of the homeboys, man, you know what, if you ever see my son and, you know, let me know, you know, tell him, you know, don't, don't allow him to hang around, you know, and stuff like that. But, um, I always snuck and did it anyway, you know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah, so little by little, man, it, it kind of unraveled with the divorce of my parents. And then, um, at the, uh, at the courts, the courts granted my grandmother and my grandfather legal custody of me and my sister um because we didn't want to stay with my mom because once again my grandma allowed us to have that freedom to do kind of a little bit what we wanted to do you know what i mean yes yeah, yeah, so yeah. we went and in you know, divorce divorce is devastating man you know, it hurts, I know especially for the kids man and right and uh um, before we go on mike um i want to take a little pit stop here um before we go on and like how you ended up in juvenile hall and all that stuff, um, you're seeing if, for anybody that doesn't know Artisha, it's, it's a, it's a very well-known uh, neighborhood. And I think Mike, uh, you, your dad was pretty well known, you know, big Mike and, you know, so 
in that neighborhood, there was, you know, there was a lot of guys who were OGs. And, uh, you know, could you tell us about, like, some of these guys you were seeing? Because some of them are legends, bro. You know, some of them are legends, you know, from, you know, Weddle, you know, to, to others, you know. Like, these are the guys you grew up looking up to as a little kid. Can you tell us a little about that and how that influenced you? Right. Yeah, like, when my generation, like, from my neighborhood, from Artesia, we had different cliques. So we had the midget locals, we had the peewee locals, uh, the 190s and Devlin Street. I was from Devlin Street. And um, so, you know, like when when my dad used to take me around, I was a little boy, man. And um, he used to introduce me to these guys. I didn't know too much about anybody or, or anything, you know. And um, but little by little, when I got jumped in to Artesia, um, you know, I, I started to, you know, uh, learn more about the, the, the neighborhood and, you know, who was there and who was who. And, um, you know, out of respect for my dad, um, you know, everybody would kind of, you know, just um, tell him everything that I was doing and stuff like that. And, you know, because when I got jumped in, I got jumped in at Artesia Park. And um, I was I was like, man, I, I can remember I was like 10 years old, nine, 10 years old. And um, my dad was there counting the watch, you know, and I remember the older homeboys that, that, that jumped me in, they were like 19, 20 years old, you know what I mean? 18. And my dad was like, I remember my dad even stopped the watch, man. And he said, you know what? Stop. Cause I was a skinny little kid and I fell down and I remember he, he picked me up and he goes, you get up and you fight, you know, you fight back, you know? And, um, <laughs> after that, man, he picked me up and, um, my dad is the one that named me and he, they, he called me boy um, because um, I was one of the smallest uh, uh, youngsters from the neighborhood. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, all these other guys, you know, like the OGs and stuff. I, I, I didn't really know um, a lot of them. I, I just knew that when I grew up, like uh, and meeting them and, and uh, a lot of them, uh, you know, went off to go, you know, do time and stuff like that. But my generation, um, you know, it was uh, me running the streets right there on Devlin Street, the 190s, um, you know, just a lot of, a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of drama, man, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, I wasn't just one of those ones that, you know, were, were um, uh, hanging up, uh, uh, holding up the wall, spray painting or nothing like that, man. It was a really wicked, evil life, man, lifestyle. And um, it was, it was uh, a lot of lessons to be learned, you know? Yeah, yeah it, was, it was rough, man. It was rough. Yeah, yeah. And I know, um, man, some of the neighborhoods that are around you guys, I know you guys had some wars, you know. And, and what's cool is you're not that no more. So we're not glorifying that life as we talk. Right, we're, right. We're talking about, and even those older guys, you know, we're, you know, some of those older guys that, you know, are very well known. And, you know, we're just, uh, you know, it's cool, man. Um, juvenile Hall, how'd you start getting busted? Man, juvenile hall, man, it was, um, I was already deep into the gang life, man. And, um, you know, um, I think my first time at juvenile hall, I got busted for attempted murder. Um, I was 12 years old. Um, I went into, uh, Los Padrinos, um, not knowing really like anything. I didn't know the system. Um, I was a youngster and long and behold, <clears throat> I had to go in there for my first time for attempted murder, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, from uh, that point on, you know, like I started to learn the ropes. I started to learn the system, you know what I mean? And um, I was just, um, you know, just uh, uh, as I went along, you know, my dad at that time, um, you know, was already busted. I think he got 14 years Um you know, to, I think he did out of the whole term, he did 14 years in prison. And, um, but at that time he was already busted. So, um, you know, he was up there in Corcoran with Manson, Charles Manson, level four, you know what I mean? And um, so when I got busted in juvenile hall for the first time, my grandparents used to come see me, then they used to go see him, you know what I mean? And it was kind of like a pattern, you know, but I can say this, man, that my grandparents, man, rain or shine, bro, they were there, man. Wherever I went, Los Padrinos, Central, Silmar, 
you know, uh, Challenger, Lancaster, wherever it was, man, they were in that line, bro, every Saturday to see me, bro. You know, no matter what, grandma loved me, bro. And that was an unconditional love because she had the love of God in her, man, always praying for us, always believing in us, never giving up, never closing her doors to us, bro. You know what I mean? Man, and that, that's beautiful. That was, that was unconditional, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, yeah. in fact, in fact, Mike, in the times I was doing time, my grandmother would do the same. She only spoke Spanish and she would come and visit me and open the, and read Psalms in Spanish. I didn't even know what she was saying, but <laughs> you know, it, it prayers work, bro. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, bro. Definitely. Let me ask you, let me ask you, when you went into juvenile hall, like, uh, was it on in there? Were you guys fighting? Was there other, you know, was there gang beefs inside? How was it in juvenile hall and, and as you're going to the county and stuff? Mm, in Los Padrinos, um, I could say this, um, there was just a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, you could say, like game playing, you know what I mean? Mind games, um, you know, um, now with the juvenile hall, as we all know, it's just the gang, uh, you know, with your enemies, you know what I mean? But um, so, you know, with the Hawaiian Gardens or Norwalk, um, those were a lot of our enemies at the time. And um, so if we see, you know, in Juvenile Hall, if you see your enemy, you know, you got to get busy, you got to get down, you know what I mean? And um, I remember when there was a time where I was going from Juvenile Hall to Camp Miller, I was going up, up to Camp Miller and, uh, you know, we're shackled in the bus and we're, you know, we're, we're taking the ride and, you know, there's always instigators, you know what I mean? There's always the instigators and um, they knew I was from Artesia. And this one youngster, he's telling me, hey, we're going to get to the camp. And, you know, there's three bottles from Norwalk there. You know what I mean? They're going to roll you up or whatever. And I, I was just quiet, man. You know, I didn't I didn't feed into it. So when we got there, um, you know, sure enough, man, there was three big, three big old dudes from Norwalk. And um, I'm, a, I'm a skinny kid. You know, I was skinny at the time. They kind of, you know, <clears throat> and so but um, I remember, man, I got to the camp and then one was serving the food and uh you know he gave me like a little bit of food man in my plate you know what i mean he's like barrio norwalk you know i told marquisia and um then when i that same day that was my first day in camp and then the other vata for norwalk gave me the you know shower roll with my shirt and my drawers and everything and so i opened it up and he goes barrio norwalk same thing you know and i told marquisia so you know, I opened up the roll and the whole shirt was ripped, you know what I mean? And um, so there was three dudes, man. There was three of them, man. And um, I just, I, I told this guy from 18th Street, man, I said, you know what? One of the bottles from Norwalk was um, a laundry boy. He worked in the laundry. So I said, man, you know what? I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get busy with all three of them, bro. You know what I mean? I gotta get down. So I told the bottle from Norwalk, I said, let's set it up, bro. We're running the laundry room and and let's get busy all three of you guys with me you know let's 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 do it now you know what i mean so if you didn't do that then basically you know that that was still you know that it would just be tension all the way around you know what i mean and even though even though like um you know we didn't get along man after that there was a little bit of respect you know what i mean and um um in camp there's different you know there's laundry there's like people working in the office so by the end of the time i did a year there by the end of the time that i got out um i was um basically in charge of all the mail you know what i mean so even though me and that there was one more vato from norwalk after nine months or whatever he was giving me brand new clothes and I was hooking him up with his mail. You know what I mean? Cause if I didn't, if I didn't get taken care of, he wasn't going to get his mail. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so once again, it's just a, it, it's a, it's a mind game. It's a respect game. And that's, that's just, that goes for juvies camps, YA or whatever, you know what I mean? But in, in the County, it's a whole different ball game. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so tell us about graduating to the County and um, what got you there. And then, um, what were your thoughts going in there? You know, I know your dad had probably already trained you, but what was your thoughts? Man, you know, uh, it was, um, you know, in juvenile hall, um, it was, it was different. Um, being locked up in that room, you know, in juvenile hall, there was no bars. There was just a little tiny window. 
I spent a lot of time in those rooms, man. And I remember, um, um, you know, even uh, I was up in Lancaster and um, I wasn't feeling good, man. I felt sick. And I would tell the staff and I was like, hey, man, I'm sick. Something's wrong with me. They didn't care. They didn't believe me. They were giving me Pepto and all that. So um, basically one day, man, I just we came out for line movement and I fell out, man. I passed out. And next thing you know, man, I woke up at High Desert Hospital in Lancaster, handcuffed to the bed. And they're telling me, we got to get you in surgery right away, your appendix rupture. You know what I mean? So the the poison from the appendix was was going through my body already. I almost died. So uh, when I woke up out of surgery, my whole right side of my stomach was left open, man. I, I, I can see my insides. You know what I mean? They had a pump on the bottom pumping all the poison out. I woke up handcuffed to the bed, man. And I remember my grandma coming up and she goes, man, and she goes, why is he handcuffed? You know, like unhandcuff him. You know, she didn't understand. She's like, what is he going to do? You know? And um, I almost died, man. I almost didn't make it. And um, I remember when they released me from High Desert Hospital, they put me back in, a, 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 you know, we don't call them cells in juvie, but in, in the camp, it's like a, a room. You know what I mean? It's like the hole. And so they put me in that in that room, man, for like three weeks straight, man, because I had stitches. I couldn't move. I wasn't in trouble, but they didn't want to put me back in population because they were afraid that, you know, I would get hurt or my stitches would open or whatever. But I stayed in that room, man, for three weeks. And I remember I still had about four months to go of my time. And my caseworker walked in one day, man, and I told her, man, you know what? I got to get out of here, man. You know what? This is this is crazy. They got me locked down, you know, like 22 hours a day. You know what I mean? And I go, um, she goes, you know what? I got good news for you. They're letting you out a little early because your grandma was going to sue them. You know what I mean? Because they didn't, they didn't listen to me, bro, because... My side was hurting. I almost died. You know what I mean? So um, she goes, they're going to let you out about a couple months early or whatever. You're going to court this week or whatever. So I got released, man, and uh, went back to Los Padrinos, got released from there. And um, but I graduated, you know, the next step was the county jail. And when I hit the county, man, it was like totally different story, man. And um, I was in 9500 Baker's Road, the gang module. Um, pause you know. right there, guys. It's really quick, Mike. We'll pause right there. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to watch one of Michael's videos. We'll be right back. It's always hard, man, to come here sometimes, you know? No, I understand you, man, but you know what? The main thing is you're here, man, and your pops is proud of you. Home, see what I mean? You know, I seen this vision, bro, when I was driving my ride, and then I went to the pad, and it's just the vision that God gave me. He said, put this, put this together, that it was going to reach a lot of people. You know what I mean? Here we are today, man. It's, you know, I just want to say, gracias, bro, for always supporting me, dog. I appreciate hey, you know, it, bro. You know, I got your back, man. You're going to be great, homie. You got to keep this up. Let's do this. Away from you, no. 
never give up, never lose hope I would go blind, take it One day at a time Never give up, never lose hope I would go blind Life has got you down, it will come around Even when you smile, people see you frown Father God, help me now, can you hear the prayer of this man? I've been with the best, seen many fall People come and go, let me stand tall Holy Spirit of the living God, show me I can Let me dust it off from my 501s and my white knights Do I have it in me, Father God, one time, one last fight Grab my favorite keyboard, talk box, let loose for Christ Nothing's gonna stop me, grab my holy word, now that's nice When it comes down, who will be around, just that true friend How you gonna be, no one to blame in the end Who you gonna talk to when that phone it don't ring Who you gonna love when the party stops, it don't sing I'ma keep it me, tell me what you see I'ma keep it coming only cause I'm free Nothing gonna stop me from giving my best Take it one day at a time Never give up, never lose hope I would go blind What you've done, never did I think I would ever run But I'll sing it to you, all day if I can I'll sing it if I want, rap it if I can Never let you go, sticking to his plan Jesus is the way, so turn up the jam Never take it from me God, now the melody and the chords Music is the way that I say thank you, my lord No words can express just how it sets my soul free I take it real close, take it up, now look at a G Don't burn it down, just take your time, Christian, know this last Take it one day and just don't live it too fast People say the best song is always written from the way a man feels I say the best song comes from the struggle that's real They wanna see you fail, live a life of hell They don't even care, put you up in jail People always gonna talk, but God loves you the same Take it, one day at a time Never give up, never lose hope, I would go blind Take it, one day at a time Never give up, never lose hope, I would go blind Take it, one day at a time Never give up, never lose hope, I would go blind All right, we hope you guys like that video. Mike, why don't you tell us about that video we just seen? Mm, man, that video, um, I'd rather be yours. Um, we shot it at Rose Hill Cemetery. I had the vision, man, in my, in my head because um, 
you know, my dad is uh, buried there, rest in peace. And, um, you know, when I came up with that vision, uh, I asked the drummer of war, Sal Rodriguez, um, you know, um, to be in it, you know, to be in the song with me. And um, a lot of people showed up, man. And a lot of people showed up. And um, that video went viral, man. And uh, I know that it has almost 3 million views on Facebook. And um, it, was, it was just a blessing, man. And just for everybody out there, man, that's going through it, it's just an uplifting song, positive song. Um, you know, everybody just had nothing but good things to say about it, you know? And I'm sure they could get that song on iTunes and everywhere. Is that oh yeah, iTunes, uh just punch in second chance. I'd rather be yours and it's right there on iTunes. Yeah. Probably everywhere, right? Go daddy everywhere, I, I assume. Yeah. Spotify, iTunes, um, Rap City, Amazon, everything, yeah. Okay, that was that was awesome, guys. So I hope you liked it. And then um so we were talking a little while ago before the break about you you know, Juvenile Hall. Now you're talking about graduating in to the county jail. Tell us about it and what are your first thoughts going in there? Who did you see and, and how was it? Man, you know, uh, my first thoughts, man, because we, we used to go to Lakewood Station. So Lakewood Station was the station where we would uh, uh, travel from, you know, or Cerritos Court, Municipal Court, that would take you straight to the county jail. And um, when I went to the county jail, man, it was, um, you know, I knew that it was going to be different because they don't play the little mind games, you know, of, 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 of uh, enemies, you know, like, okay, you're from Norwalk, I'm from Artesia. Um, but, you know, in, in the county, we run together, you know what I mean? Like um, the Sureños or, or say like we're the Southeast car, you know what I mean? Like Southeast, we run together, Norwalk, Hawaiian Gardens, Artesia, you know, Chivas, we, you know, we were like, okay, we're cool in there, you know what I mean? Like everything's good, but, you know, it was a whole, a whole nother, whole nother experience man you know I was in uh, 9500 and as I passed through 9500 man I was like wow you know this is um, my first time there it was different you know what I mean a lot of fools holding tanks man were just tore up from the floor up bro like you know you couldn't even move man like people were just laying on the floor like it was it was just you know tore up man and um when we finally went up you know to um, 9500 then they shipped me to Baker's Road and then you know, um, it was just like, it was Christmas time. I think it was during Christmas. And I was like, man, you know what? It was just like, I, I started to think, you know, and I was like, man, you know what? Is this all there is for my life? You know, I was sitting on the bunk and because uh, in Baker's Road, they got like um, bunk beds and then they got cells, you know, up above, you know, the, the tier. And, um, you know, that's when, you know, that's when it started to get, you know, like real, you know what I mean? And I was like, man, you know what? I started getting tired, man. And I was like, man, you know what? I'm tired of this, you know, start to get tired of this lifestyle, you know, tired of being busted. Cause I was busted all the time. Paul was like, I was busted through Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year's birthday parties. You know what I mean? Like every year, every year on the same phone, man, making the same call, saying the same thing in letters after letter, bro, thing, saying things are going to get better. But, you know, that was just the same old story, man. You know, when I got out, you know, I never changed, man. It was just right back to the, right back to, uh, to my vomit. You know what I mean? Like, like they say in the Bible, it says like a dog goes back to his vomit, you know, yeah. and I would just go back, man. And, and I couldn't get out of it, man. It was like a cycle, you know? Yeah. And I was like, I was like compelled, man. I was compelled to the gang lifestyle, man. I was like, um, it was a rush for me, man. Like to, to, to be a gang member, it was a rush for me. And I, and like I said, man, I wasn't like those that know me that, that are probably watching this. If you know me personally, I wasn't just one of those fools that were just holding up the wall, spray painting. You know what I mean? I was dedicated. I was, I put my full dedication into, into my barrio and, and everything that I did, man, I wasn't a punk. I wasn't soft. I was, I was down for mine. I, I was a very wicked and evil man, you know? Wow. That's crazy, bro. It's crazy knowing you now, like, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think, you know, because right. I transformed your life and made you a, a humble, nice guy, you know, and, That's right. you, you know, but uh, now take us to the steps. What led to the changing of your life? Take us to the steps and, and how did that happen? Man, uh, I got I got out of the LA County Jail 
and uh, went right back into the streets again, you know, back in rotation, back, you know, doing what I was doing. Um, and um, my sister uh, was from Chivas. Now, Chivas is a, a, a gang in Articia. And, um, you know, um, she was down, bro. She was like, you know, anybody knows my sister, bro, she would get down. She was down for the barrio. And, um, you know, that was that was my homegirl, you know, it was, it was me, my dad and her bro. And, um, when they seen, you know, when, when the homies seen my dad coming, bro, you know, it was like, man, it was on bro. You know what I mean? They knew what time it was. Um, you know, they, you know, my dad actually kind of set the, set the, how can I say it? Set the, um, set the atmosphere of the stone for me. And, um, you know, the homies knew that, you know, my dad was no punk either. You know what I mean? That he's yeah. been around. And um, so with my sister, um, you know, when I got out this last time, um, she gave her life to the Lord. And, you know, I remember her, uh, uh, you know, kind of disappearing for a little bit. And I was still doing my thing. And um, I was gunned down coming from Compton because Compton is, I was a big, I, I, I smoked a lot of PCP. And um, that was my that was my high, you know, you gang it? banging and dipping the juice. You yeah. know what I mean? He used to dip the juice, man. And um, so I would score right there in Compton or Watts, or we would go down to State Street in LA, and Brooklyn off of Brooklyn. And so I was coming from Compton, and I got on the 91 freeway, man. And um, there was some fools, man. It was my my enemies, you know. And uh, so I never backed down, bro. I never backed down. And, so they shot me, they shot me down, bro, in the ditch right there off the 91 freeway, bro. I was left for dead right off the on the off ramp. And um uh I blacked out, you know, I blacked out. And um so what I can recall, bro, is um the the highway patrol said that he was patrolling, you know, off the freeway. And um he seen a car in the ditch, so he made a U-turn, he went back and and uh, I was in a coma, bro, after that. Wow. And they found me. So I woke up in this machine going upside down, bro. Wow. And um, uh, when I woke up, my sister ran up to me and she said that she had been praying for me, you know. And I was a little out of it. I didn't quite understand what was going on, bro. And um, so uh, she goes, nah, I, you know, I got saved, you know, and I gave my life to the Lord. And I didn't know what that was, bro, because to me, bro, um, a, a Christian, like a, a lot of a lot of fools, when I was busted, I never respected Christians because they would hide behind that lifestyle just to get through their time just a little bit easier. You know what I mean? And then when I would see them when they got out, it, they, you know they were just doing their thing again and I was like hey homie weren't you just like you know preaching to me or, or or saying whatever you were but when they got out it was a whole different story you know what I mean so I, I didn't really trip on that lifestyle I thought like you know like people that turned Christian were just you know like punks you know lames they were soft you know what I mean and I was just like that's just an excuse for them to you know get, try to get by you know what I mean and so um but uh, she didn't give up, man. After I got better a little bit, um, um, she kept inviting me to church, kept inviting me. Oh, nah, I'm good. I told her, now nah, I'm good. You know, I was a little embarrassed, man, you know, because um, some of the homies, they would ask and stuff. And I was just like, yeah, she's doing good. You know what I mean? She's trying to, you know, do something different or whatever. And um, But I was embarrassed, man. I was embarrassed because the lifestyle that we lived, it was a, to me, it was a sign of weakness. You know what I mean? And, um, so anyway, I make a long story short, um, um, you know, I was, um, going to face some more time in the County jail for under, I think it was like a, under the influence, like a 90 day thing or something. And, um, so I went to court and she heard I went to court. So she, she called me, she goes, Hey Mike, um, uh, we have a program in our church, you know, that you can, um, you know, be rehabilitated or whatever. So, and then I was thinking, hmm, you know, I was like, well, if I could do 90 days or or six months in this church home and use God just to get out of the situation, mm -hmm. you know, then I'll I'll go ahead and do it, you know, because I didn't want to go back to the county. Nobody does, you know. So um, sure enough, man, um, she invited me to church and she goes, I'm going to rap. 
I'm going to rap a song, you know, I was like, rap, what do you mean rap? Because, you know, understand, man, I was a gang member and I, and, and I didn't respect rappers because, um, we call them studio gangsters, you know, and a studio gangster is one that will make up a lifestyle just to make money off of uh, the audience you know or or just to look good and sound hard but they didn't really live that life you know and I don't know about you but I was brought up on some real on some real gangster music and that was NWA you know and um but all these other rappers and stuff so my sister said she was rapping and I was like why why are you like doing that I was embarrassed bro I was like why are you gonna do that for like you know you're, you're gonna make yourself look dumb you know and um but now nah, she 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 was like i'm gonna do it you know i'm gonna do it so i went to support her bro and um i showed up at the church that day and i remember i sat way in the back bro and um you know i remember creeping in there i think i was high a little bit and uh she came out bro and uh that song came on you know with the uh that jam on it beat and um I never been in a Christian church before, bro. That was my very first time. I was raised as a Catholic. I did my first Holy Communion, catechism, all that, bro. And um, so when I seen everybody like clapping and, you know, into it, and then they threw the old school beat on, but she came out and the words were different and she tore it up, bro. I got to give it to her, man. She, she, she can get down on rapping, bro. And um, so after that she called me to the front she goes hey Mike come to the front and she introduced me to some guy and it was um, the men's home director of the church you know and he said hey uh I understand you you know you might be going back to the county to do some time and I said yeah and he's like well why don't you come into our men's home you know we'll help you out I'll go to court with you and I looked at him like I was looking at him and I told him this man I said you don't even know me, bro. I said, why are you going to help me and do try to do something for me? I had an attitude, you know what I mean? And, um, uh, you know, he goes, um, no, no, no. I, so anyway, I gave him the date, the court date. So I went to Norwalk court and, uh, Norwalk superior court. And, uh, I seen all these dudes in the front row with their ties and tattoos and long and behold, bro, they showed up and they told the judge, you know, we're from this church in Norwalk, California. We want to, you know, ask you if Mike could come into our rehabilitation home and do his time. And um, the judge granted it, bro. So I was like, man, you know what? Uh, I wanted to use God, bro. I wanted to say, okay, let me do some time in this home and then bounce. You know what I mean? And, um, but that's when instead of me using God, God started to get a hold of me, bro, in that home. And, you know, I didn't understand anything, bro. I was so lost and confused, bro. And when I went into that home and, you know, they didn't have no TV, no radio. Um, they didn't eat on Wednesdays. And, you know, I, I started seeing this. I didn't want to be there, bro. I wanted to leave, you know, because it was just a house. I could just walk out the door. You know what I mean? Right. And, um, you know, dudes were boxing in the backyard, like fighting over different things. And, I go, man, you know what? All this is fake. You know, I don't want no part of this, bro. Right. I just wanted to just do my time and get out. You know what I mean? And, um, but little by little, man, you know, like something, you know, started taking place uh, inside, inside my mind and my heart. And, um, and I didn't know back then, bro, but that was the Holy Spirit, you know? And um, uh, I just, I just felt this little tugging, man, this tugging, you know? And, um, you know, I said, man, you know, and the hardest part for me, Paul, was the transformation of my mind because the lifestyle that I live, um, you know, was very wicked. And now, you know, now I'm trying to submit that lifestyle to the Lord, you know, and trying to change that the way my thinking was, you know, um, because I would just get up, bro, in the mornings and I would think, okay, who am I going to hurt today? You know, what What can I do to, um, you know, get to my enemies or whatever it was, bro. And um, but now I'm waking up thinking, OK, how am I going to like change this, you know, and, and how am I going to change this right here? And it was hard for me, bro. It was like war, brother. It was like war. And I was like uh, in a tug of war with the devil and God, bro. And just, you know, the devil was like man, I'm not going to give up this fool, you know what I mean? And God was right there, bro, just like, man, this is my guy, you know? And um, so anyway, I graduated from 
from the man's home, bro. And um, um, God did, man, God was working on me, bro. You know what I mean? Yeah, he was working. Did you already submit your life? I did at a, to a certain extent, bro. You know, like I was, uh, I gave my life to the Lord when I was in the men's home, but I wasn't totally surrendered, bro. I wasn't ready for that. You know, I wasn't like, I was playing, you know, I was, I was like one foot in, you know, like, uh, I don't know yet. You know what I mean? And uh, I was still at war, bro. I was still battling. And that was the hardest part for me, you know? And, um, you know, when I got out of the home, um, you know, it was just like, I had it. We moved from Artesia to Oxnard, and um, you know that that's kind of like what helped me to kind of you know get a little get out a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, sometimes, sometimes when we're in the hood, all we know is the hood. We don't mm -hmm. realize that there's life outside, man. Like moving to Oxnard or you know wherever, it, right? It really like helped you so much, bro. Because we're we're tunnel vision in the hood, bro. Right. Right. And it was um it was a good move I could say man because it gave me time to think you know it came it gave me time to breathe you know what I mean and um um I started going to church in Oxnard and um I was new you know fresh out the home and I remember my pastor there was a pastor that I was under and he was like hey we want to do like a car show or event you know what I mean and I told him. I don't know nothing about that. I'm just, I'm just trying to make it, you know, I'm still battling with my, myself, you know what right. I mean? I, I didn't know anything about, you know, an event or music or anything, bro. I was still like trying to fight myself, you know, I'm trying not to go back to what I was doing before, you know? And, um, so as a kid, um, my dad would pick me up from elementary school and he was a big fan of Brenton Wood, bro. Everybody knew Brenton Wood, you know right. what I mean? I knew all his songs by the time I was eight, bro, seven, you know? Legend. In fact, so, that's a picture of him right behind you, right? That's, that's him right there, bro. The and he the signed that to me. Yeah, he signed that to me. And then this is my album with him under his record label, uh, Lord Hear My Prayer. But we'll talk about that. And, um, but yeah, man, my pastor told me, you know, like, who do you think we should bring? We want to draw a lot of people, you know? And first thing in my mind was, Brent Wood, you know, because, I mean, that's all I knew because my dad, you know, used to listen to him all the time, man. And um, so he looked at me and he laughed and he was like, oh, yeah, sure, you know. And so um, he goes, well, why don't you go home and like jump on the Internet, get some information on Brent Wood. And I was like, you serious? And he's like, yeah. So I came home that night and I Googled Brent Wood and there was a phone number on there. So I called the number you know what I mean and I'm like hey uh I was a little nervous you know and long and behold Brent Wood answered the phone bro and <laughs> and uh Crazy. they say miracles happen bro you know what I mean I mean I didn't Paul I'm gonna tell you bro I didn't know that God had a plan for my life I didn't know where I was gonna be or what I was gonna go bro I mean I was supposed to die bro many times bro and um here I am, bro, fresh out of the man's home, talking to Brent Wood on the phone, you know, and I'm like, hey, Brent, um, I said, Mr. Wood, out of respect, and I said, uh, uh, my name is Michael Gonzalez, and I, I, I don't even know why I'm calling you, I said, because I, I my pastor asked me to call you, uh, I'm a next gang member, uh, I'm trying to straighten out my life, you know what I mean, and um, he's like, um, I go, how much would it cost to bring you to Oxnard? And he told me $5,000. And I was like, wow, $5,000, man. I wanted to hang up the phone, bro. I just know, I didn't know what, I didn't have $5,000, bro. And I knew my pastor didn't have $5,000. So I was like, okay, well, let me, let me check on a couple of things. I'll get back to you, you know? So um, I went back to my pastor and I told him, hey, this is what he said. He goes, tell him we want to bring him. So we start washing cars, bro. We started believing in the vision that my pastor had, and it became my vision because I jumped on board and I, and I backed up my pastor, and we raised that money, bro. We labored for it. And I remember this, bro. When Brenton Wood came to our event, um, there was thousands of people, bro. Thousands of people showed up. Like, I'm not even exaggerating, bro. The whole street was filled with people, bro. And we had a car show. And I remember that day, bro, when I handed the money to Brenton Wood in his hand, I didn't only give him and pay him money, bro. I believed that I planted a seed 
not in only my life, but but his life. There was a plan, bro. God was doing something. You know what I mean? And um, I truly believe that, man. You know, my pastor always says, when you have a need, sow a seed. You know what I mean? And and I, I didn't even really do music, bro. Like yet, um, I did some music, and and um, I know we skipped that part, but. Um, after my sister rapped and I was in the men's home and all that, I got out and my sister would encourage me. To, she goes, why don't you write a song, Mike? You know, I was like, nah, nah, I'm not a songwriter. I'm not a rapper. All I wanted to do, Paul, was sit way in the back in the church, man, and just get my life together and my mind because that was my battle. I was my right. battle, you know? And um, I, I, she goes, why don't you just write a song about what you're feeling, you know, what you're battling up here. And so I wrote it. I got in front of the church and I, and I shared it as a poem and it turned into a song. And, and, and this was like, God just revealed the gift, bro, of, of music to me. I, I'd never rapped in the world. I wasn't a musician. I was a gang member. But when I received the Holy Spirit, that was the gift that God gave me was music. You know what I mean? And uh, I know there's a lot of rappers that come from the world. They bring that into Christianity with them and they turn it around and there's nothing wrong with that. But with me, it was just a gift that God gave me when I received the spirit, you know? Incredible, man. Yeah. And, and, and man, keep telling us about, about your rap career. Like uh, I know you work with Brenton. I know you worked with uh, the Troutman family. Um, go into all that, man, and and, and and then and then get us into where you know you're starting to act and all that stuff. Okay, yeah. So after I met Brenton, after we hired him to come, and um, I was getting Brenton, I would call him a few times, and um, I would say, "Hey, Brenton, uh, I got you another church event. Like, you know, where you want to go?" And he's like, "Yeah, man." So eventually, we started building some type of relationship. But to him, it was money. He was making money, you know, in business. But I was trying to build a, a, a friendship, you know. And so um, he goes, "Man, you're helping me so much, man." He goes, "Why don't we do a song for the Lord?" You know, and I'm like, "Really?" You know. And uh, I wrote the song overnight, Paul. Like, I didn't hesitate, bro. This is a, uh, you know, you, you, he, Brenton Wood was talking to a kid that was raised on his music. Uh, uh, you know, my dad loved him, bro. And it, it, to me, it was just a miracle, bro, to yeah. even talk to Brenton Wood. You know what I mean? And um, so I wrote the song overnight, man. I wrote it. I called him. I said, hey, Brent, check this out, man. I wrote the song. He's like, dang, you didn't waste no time. I said, no, man. I, I truly believe that when there's an opportunity and God gives you an open door, you have to go through that open door because the the, the season may not come back around. You got to act in the timing of the Lord, you know, and I truly believe that it was God's timing. God said, you know what? Don't waste no time. Run through this door. Use it as a, an experience. I'm going to bless you, you know? They told me that scripture that I was going to go before uh, uh, kings, you know, and, 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 and I don't know, I, I haven't read it, but for a while, but it, it says you're going to go before kings and, uh, and men, I think uh, I got to look it up, but, um, and it meant that it was interpreted to me that I was going to come before people that were famous in the world and God was going to use them in my life. Um, in this chapter, in different chapters of my life, you know, and so um, when I told Brenton, I said, hey, I wrote the song, he's like, all right, man, he's like, let's get in the studio, let's put it down, so we, we had brought Brenton to Oxnard, man, we, we put it down in the studio, and then, so that song he put on iTunes, and he's seen the response, he's seen the response, and you're talking about Brenton Wood, man, Brenton Wood, um, you know, uh, he goes, Mike, it's going so well. What, what do you think about doing a single, you know, like a single album, two songs or something? So I go, all right, you know, let's try it. So we did another song. We put the single out there on iTunes and it just took off, man. Next thing you know, Brent's calling me. He's like, Mike, I want you to travel with me to do this show. I want to do that one song with you. And I'm like, okay, that's cool, man. I was excited. Yeah. I, was like, I was like, let's do it, you know? Yeah. And um, so, but he told me this, he goes, you got to pay your own flight. You got to pay your own hotel. 
I can't pay you for the show. You're just going to come up for that one song. I said, man, let's do it. You know what I mean? Because to me, it was like, there's always a price to pay for the dream and the vision that God gives to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, it, and it's, it's not going to come easy. You know, you got to sacrifice something. You got to put in the work. Yeah. It's not just going to happen overnight. You know what I mean? Right. And how many other people are traveling with Brenton Wood? <laughs> right. You know? I, I would, no, I say this humbly. And I was the only artist ever signed to Mr. Brenton Wood Records was Second Chance. I have the proof here. You know, he, he put right here, it says yeah. my first artist, Second Chance. Um, you know, to actually sign on the dotted line and, and for him to promote an artist was, was second chance, you know? And I was, I was, I was humbled, man. And I remember when uh, I went with him and opened up for the first time, man, I was excited. Bro. I was, I was nervous. Um, I remember it was me. It was Midnight Star, um, the SOS band, Brenton Wood, like big names, man. And I was sitting there like, what? the heck am I doing here you know what I mean and so he's up there in his zoo suit there's thousands of people in the stadium and um you know he stops Oogum Boogum he's done with singing Oogum Boogum and he goes man you know what I want to I want to take this time I want to call a young man up uh you know he he was a gang member and you know and and he's saying this you know and he's saying let's give it up for second chance and nobody claps bro so like I'm thinking, okay, well, wow, you know, like because now understand this, Paul. In the world, if they don't like your music, they will boo you off stage. I don't care who you are, but it, you know, it's not like the church. In the church, if they don't like their music, if they don't like, you know, your music, they'll still love you and clap because you know they love God. You know what I mean? But out there it was ruthless man you got people drinking you got people smoking weed you know what i mean and with their hyenas and with their ladies and so here i come they didn't clap bro so i was like wow you know so i i started praying and i was like man god am i in the right place am i doing the right thing um god said you're exactly where you need to be you get the microphone you give me glory and i will give you favor with the people yeah. you know and uh, I got that microphone, man, and I said, you know what? I just want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for everything he's done in my life. And you know what they did? They stood to their feet, and they began to applaud, man. And I knew God said, you're exactly where you need to be. Wow. You stay in this season, and I'm going to use it, you know? So um, me and Brenton did our song together, and uh, it was only one song, remember? Yeah. So then Brenton calls me, and he goes, Mike, you know what? Um I, I want to start putting you on my shows. Um, I want to, I want to change that two song album to a full album. I want to, you know, do this Mr. Wood records thing with you. And, um, you know, so next thing you know, um, it went from doing one song with Brenton Wood to opening up for him. So now, now imagine this promoters would call him and hire him for shows. And he would tell them, uh, you need to put my artist on the show. If my artist can't open up for me, I will not be on your show. He told them that. And I was like, wow. So, you know, uh, what are they going to say? You know, that's Brent Wood. So they would put me on, even if they didn't like it, they would put me on. <laughs> and, and a lot of promoters, a lot of promoters didn't like it, bro. Yeah. They didn't like it because, you know, my style, you know, um, the message behind the music and, um, so, but they had no choice, man. So I started opening up for Brenton and, um, you know, just, it started, man, it started, you know, just hitting bro. And, you know, it was, it was an awesome season of my life, bro. And yeah, man, how many years? Uh, almost, uh, I would say about six and a half years, bro. I was with wow. Brenton. That and, is incredible. That's an incredible story, bro. Because Brenton, man, he's almost like to us, Rasa. Man, he's almost like one of us. We all grew up with him, bro. Right. I don't know about the youngsters now, but people like my age, man, he, he he's awesome, man. Definitely, yeah. man. Definitely, then, man. Um, tell us the what came next, and, and how did you meet the Troutmans, and 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 I don't even know what it's called, the Voice Box, or you know all that. Yeah, the Talk Box, man. Talk and, Box. Uh, yeah. Um. Well, when I was with Brent Wood, I was just rapping. I never played the box. I never played piano. I didn't know how to play keyboard. 
Um, you know, so when I was on tour with Brenton Wood, we were on tour with Zap, you know. Roger passed away, of course, but um, Terry Troutman is Roger's brother. They took over the group. So I remember uh, coming off stage, Zap went on, and I was watching the show. And as I was sitting in the back, man, there was something like inside me, man. I was like, man, you know what? I, I could do that, you know? And uh, I go, but I don't, I didn't know how to like go about it or play nothing, you know? So what I did is that day, I remember I seen the show and God put something in, in, in me to, to, to want to play that instrument, you know? And what I did is I went back on YouTube and, I was checking everything out. Um, uh, I got the keyboard, the voice box, and now I said, okay, how am I going to learn this? I don't know anything about, you know, keys or, you know, uh, piano. So I started to teach myself. I started to learn how to play the piano first. So um, I began to learn and teach myself the keys, the notes, the harmonies, um, because now with the talk box, you're playing single notes. So now when you record in the studio, you have to build off that single note with the harmonies and it sounds thicker. But, um, so what happened was, is, uh, uh, MC, Bo I met MC Boulevard, MC Boulevard, um, gave his life to the Lord and, and we hooked up, we were on this TV show together talking about our testimonies and, um, I told him, man, you know what? I want to have a show out here in Oxnard, you know, at the Performing Arts Center. And he was like, I go, who do you think we should bring, man? So he knew Rufus Troutman, which was Roger's nephew. And um, MC Boulevard introduced me to Rufus Troutman. And me and Rufus Troutman became real good friends. And Rufus knew that I had a passion to play the talk box, that I had a passion to play the voice box. And he began to mentor me on the talk box. That's crazy. Yeah. And so I was just truly blessed, man. I was blown away. And um, for, for those of you who don't know that the talk box he's talking about is kind of like that robotic sounding voices that you're in zap, like do what diddy and, and you know, just all that, man. It just the computer robot. love. Yeah. California love computer. Yeah. love, So rough, so tough. Um, grapevine, you know, like all the hits, man. Roger put it out there, and what you a know, hit, uh, grapevine! That, they did a phenomenal job on that one, man. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome, man. So, so he's, um, he's training you, man, and yeah. So Rufus, um, Rufus actually kind of mentored me on that. That's how I met Rufus Troutman, and um, through MC Boulevard, wow. and um. So I was still with Brenton at that time. And then um, I got a call to, to, um, to do an event and it was at a church. And um, so they told me, this pastor calls me, he goes, I'll send you the flyer. There's going to be an actor there, you know? And I was like, cool, you know? So I opened my laptop and I seen the flyer and um, uh, I seen this actor before, you know, from Training Day. Training Day was a big movie, so right. you know, I was a big fan of Training Day. I love movies. I, I love watching movies, and um, um, so I went to this church. And um, but see what the what the trip is is that when I, when the pastor sent me the flyer, I opened my computer, and um, now this was this was after um. I told Brenton Wood that I didn't, I, I couldn't sign, you know, with him again. There was a time in my life that God had spoken to my heart and God said that the season was over. Right. Um, because if you understand now with Brenton Wood, we would do a lot of shows and, um, you know, there was, a, there was a lot of temptation. There was a lot of stuff, different things out there. So, um, now, when Brenton Wood came to me and he goes, Mike, I need you to sign another contract. I want to do another album with you. God quickened my heart. And I heard the spirit of the Lord inside tell me, no, wow, the, the, the season's over, you know? And I, I go, man, you know what? I didn't want to hear that, bro. I thought it was just like the devil lying to me or whatever. I said, why would God give you something? And now why would God want to take it away? Yeah, Because to me, it was this, bro. I was like, it was barely kicking off for me, Paul. Like um, um, the money was coming in, the 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 fame was coming in. You know what I mean? And all that stuff, bro. 
uh, I don't know, like, if people understand that, you know, the finances help, you know, like, you know, your family, you pay your bills, you know what I mean? Um, the name started blowing up a little bit, and I was in big shows, man, st you know, big stadiums, bro. And, um, you know, that feeling, bro, that when you go out on stage with a legend um, and that caliber, bro, I will never forget that feeling. You know what mm. I mean? And I used to come out, bro, with Brenton, and I used to be like this, like Cholo, you know, a little bit like, you know, um, gloves and stuff. And Brenton told me, why don't you look different, you know? And I fought him on it, bro. I fought him and I fought him on it. And I was like, nah, nah, nah. So he goes, I'm going to take you to the Zoot Suit store and I want you to try out a Zoot Suit. And I'm like, uh, it's not me, you know? Yeah, yeah. So Brent Wood, <laughs> Brent Wood took me to Anaheim, bro, to um, the Zoot Suit store. And I, try, I tried on this white Zoot Suit, bro. And once I got that feeling, bro, and I put it on, I never took it off, bro. Yeah. And, you know, he bought it for me, bro. And, um, when I came out on that stage with him, bro, it was just a feeling that was unbearable, bro. And that caliber with those lights and the people and just that whole atmosphere, it was enticing, bro. And I say this, bro, because it was only a feeling and the, we don't go off of the way that we feel. We walk by faith and not by sight, you know? And I gave up a lot, bro. A lot of people don't know out there that um, the Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. Yes, man. And I fought God on it, bro, because God told me the season was over. And God said, you know what? If you want to do your own thing and you want to sign with him again, I'm taking that covering from you and you're going to be on your own, you know? And um, so what I did, man, is I, I wrestled, you know, I wrestled with God, bro. Day and night, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. How could I tell Brenton Wood, bro, that I wouldn't want to sign with him no more? He had so much finances invested into me, bro. Um, you know, he promoted me. I respected him so much, bro. Till this day, man, I thank the man for giving me the wonderful opportunity that he has, you know. And um, but uh, God is God, bro. You know, and and if you're wrestling out there with God, you know that feeling, you know that tugging in your heart, you know when you can't sleep and when you don't have that inner peace inside of you and you're wrestling, you know. And um, I, I said, you know what, God, I can't fight no more, man. I'm just going to tell him, give it up. And I don't know what you have next for me, God, but I'm trusting you, you know. Yeah. And um, I gave up the finances. I gave up the the whole scene, man, you know, and uh, I called Brenton Wood and I'm like, hey, Brenton, um, I'm sorry, man, I, I, I can't sign. And, um, you know, like, I know you probably are not going to understand totally, but God says that, you know, he has something for me, you know, different in the direction that I'm headed. And uh, he got mad at me. He got mad at me on the phone and he told me some stuff and he's like, I made you. I gave you a name, I gave you a platform, I put you in front of thousands of people, and this is how you're going to treat me, you know? So out of respect, I, I listened, you know, and, and I don't blame him, you know, I don't blame him for getting upset. Yeah. And um, uh, I told him, you know what, Brent, I really appreciate everything, man, and, um, you know, please don't take it personal, but I got to do this. And um, I said, because God made me, and God gave me a platform, and God promised me that he would continue to bless me, you know? Yeah. So um, I was devastated, Paul. I'll tell you, bro, like, till this day, man, just speaking about it, because I could have been, like, right now, if I would have stayed with Brenton, bro, I could have been out there like MC Magic and, you know, Baby baby Bash and all them, bro. And, and But see, all that I gave up, bro, to serve the Lord. You know yeah. what I mean? And um, so, so after that, now you know, this before you go on before mm -hmm. you go on i know you probably have something good to say because i saw your yeah. face <laughs> but just say man i'm just saying this i'm getting a little ahead but you know those who win souls are wise the bible says you you've gone back to your old to artesia you've gone all over to all the hoods winning souls you chose the better but go ahead yeah man i just it was it was rough man now after I told Brenton that I was going through it, bro. I was mad at God, bro. I blamed God. I said, man, God, 
like I don't understand your plan. I don't know what's happening. I I didn't want to do music, bro. I kind of like shut down and crawled in a hole, bro, for a couple weeks and I, I didn't know what to do, bro. I was just like, did I make the right decision? You know, I I knew that I was fighting, you know. And so that's when that pastor called me and that's when he said that that um, they had this event with this actor. So when I opened the laptop and seen the flyer that he made for me and this guy, God told me and spoke to me when I seen the flyer, he goes, this is your next season. This is who you're going to work with. And I'm like, come on, you know? So I didn't say nothing, bro. What God told me, I went to this event, to this church and um, I met this actor and um I never told him what God told me because I said, you know what, God, if it's going to be you, then it's going to happen, you know, and me and this guy became really good friends, man, really good friends. And long and behold, it started to unravel, man. I started like hanging out with them, staying at his pad, you know, and one day I was, I was spending the night at his house and he woke me up and he's like, Hey Mike, check it out, man. I got this movie that I'm in. Since you're here, do you want to go? And I was like, I go, heck yeah, man, let's go. You know what I mean? Who don't want to be in a movie? You know, I, I wanted to be in a movie, you know? And um, so next thing you know, man, we're on set. I'm in, I'm in, I'm on set filming with Ice Cube and Woody Harrelson in this movie called Rampart. And I'm sitting there, man, and I'm looking around and I'm like, wow, God, God told me right then and there, he said, I had to take you out of the Brenton Wood season to move you into the new season because if you would have stayed in that season, then you would have never see this, you know? Can you say your friend's name? Noel, Noel G. Noel yeah. G. We're going to take a break, guys. We're going to leave you right. We have some more with uh, his relationship with Noel and his acting. We're going to take a quick break. Watch this video. Check it out. This is from an upcoming film that Michael's in called Kilroy. It's called The Way Out. With it. It stars him and, sec and, and um, The Message. Second Chance and The Message. Check it out. We'll be back in a second. You believe everything in that book? I do. I want to preach, I want to... I want everybody to know about Jesus. You can't serve two masters, can I? I'ma give it to you, I will let the truth be told I let fear die, homie, when I was 12 years old I was searching for acceptance, searching for a father So all the veteranos became my role models As we grew up, where I grew up You know we willing to ride and die for that hood that we threw up Me vida loca in full effect And you can tell by the ink tatted up on my neck The older I got, man, the colder I got And it was all about the suit, homie, like it or not I was slipping into darkness, my heart was getting hot Heartless, me and my filetto down a pier, Sandy Carp. The only thing on my mind, homie, was survival. Never did I think I'd meet the God of the Bible. They say for me to change, it would take a miracle. I was raised by the state, playing pinnacle. But homie, God tends to work in mysterious ways. You can go from shot calling to get insane. He took this wretched man and forgave his sins. You see, I never dropped out, homie, I dropped in. Come on. I can't even stare at this man in the mirror. All these demons and devils keep. Drawing nearer My hands are so dirty from all this dirt But deep down inside, Lord, my heart does hurt But what if I told you there's a way out? And what if I told you he can stop the drought? What if I told you you can stand for truth? It's either life or death, homie, what you gonna choose? Los Angeles is the county that I always roam But the prison yard now is the place I call my home Born and raised in the midst of the grave Reminiscing of our past We didn't play, going through the walls Posted up in the halls Raising my hand, yeah, that bottle's gonna fall Posted up a wicked times through the minor set Coming out the south side hard from the threat set Taking death as it came is how I played the game If you crossed our path, keep your shoulder to the lane I better maintain, now peep our step From the darkness to the light, yeah I'll never forget As I sit and reminisce, sometimes I go back Back in the day when I was led astray But I gotta be thankful 
for all that I got No more packing a quit there Or slinging that rock As I move from the body Oh, the Lord approached my soul It was time to surrender This was taking a toll I didn't wanna die, see On my own expectations So I gave up my life Now it's put on my salvation I can't even stare at this man in the mirror All these demons and devils keep dropping nearer My hands are so dirty from all this dirt but deep down inside, Lord, my heart does hurt But what if I told you there's a way out? And what if I told you he can stop the drought? What if I told you you can stand for truth? It's either life or death, homie, what you gonna choose? Life or death, life, 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 life or death, homie, what you gonna choose? Life or death, life or death, homie, what you gonna choose? All right, everybody, we hope you enjoyed that video. We hope you enjoyed that video. That was Michael Gonzalez, Second Chance, and the message from the movie Kilroy. Those are actually clips in that music video. So, Mike, before we go on really quick, just say something really quick about that video we just seen and that song. Man, that video, man, it was um, it was a blessing, man, you know, from the movie Kilroy, different parts, and... Um, man, the movie's going to be awesome, you know, uh, awesome message, awesome, just uh, a crew and cast. And I, I truly believe that uh, the casting, uh, um, you know, was just right on the money, you know what I mean? And, and I know that uh, a lot of the people are going to be blessed out there when it, when it hits, you know? Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get to Kilroy in a while, guys. But right now, we were on, Mike, you were talking about how you went on set. You were on set with Noel G and Ice Cube and that God had brought your relationship together as friends. He closed the door with Brenton Wood, as, not as a friend, but as working together, and now he, 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 he hooked you up with a new friend, which I know you're still friends, because I see your, you know, your pictures together with Noel G. So go on, you're on set with Ice Cube and everybody. And Yeah, man, we were just right there, man. And, um, you know, I was just tripping, man. I was like, wow, you know, like, um, I never even, beyond my wildest thoughts or, or, or dreams, man, that I would be where, I'm, where I was at. And, you know, I, w I was a gang member, man. I was like, you know, I was supposed to be spending the rest of my life in prison or, uh, you know, dead. You know, I never thought that I would make it past uh, 18. And um, here I am, you know, um, now I'm on set, a different chapter in my life. And I'm on set with uh, Woody Harrelson and everybody, and I'm sitting there, you know, in front of the camera, and I'm looking around, and I'm like, wow, you know what, God is good, man, and, you know, I, I know that sometimes you've got to give up something um, to get somewhere, you know, and, and, and there was something hard for me because I was holding on to the Brenton Wood season. And don't get me wrong, man. I, I, man, I mean, I love, I love Brenton and, you know, the music, but, um, you know, obedience, I had to obey what God was telling me because I truly took a leap of faith and said, okay, God, I'm going to trust you, you know? And, um, you know, so mine and Noel G's relationship, everybody knows him as Hector, you know, Hector from right. Fast and Furious. Um, but, uh, it just grew, man. We became good friends. We're still good friends, man. I was just with them the other day, you know, doing a, a video for Bone Thugs and Harmony. And, um, but, um, you know, after Rampart, you know, then Noel would call me and he would say, Mike, I got another movie. You know, you did good. I, I know you have a passion for acting. And um, so there was this film called Philly Brown. And Philly Brown was with Jenny Rivera, Edward James Olmos, Lou Diamond Phillips. That was before Jenny Rivera died in the car crash. I mean, the airplane crash, I'm sorry. And um, so I went on set and I met Edward James Olmos and Lou Diamond Phillips and uh, Jenny Rivera. And um, I was just blessed, man. I was like, wow, this is my second film. 
And then I started to see, man, God told me, you know, these are opportunities that I'm giving you because I'm trying to use your life in this realm, in this season with these people in Hollywood now. Yeah. You know, so first it was with Bretton Wood and then it was now in the Hollywood scene. And as a Christian man, it was like, I got a lot of slack for it, you know, because even when I was with Brenton Wood, people would say, well, why are you out there with Brenton Wood? You know, like, what are you doing? But there's always a purpose, you know? And I, I truly stick to the scripture that the Bible says that it's the sick that need a doctor, not the well. Yeah, so, man. You know, we were called to go out into the places that I was in to, you know, because who's going to relate the message that God has, you know, out in those type of places, you know what I mean? And when I was with Brenton Wood, man, even in the, in the enemy's camp, in these stadiums filled with people drinking, you know, people will come up to me after and say, man, you know what? I've been running from the Lord, man. And, and God found me in this place. You know, you spoke on something that really touched my heart and that's the places that we need to be, you know? Can I but say it's, something really quick. Yeah. Let me yeah. say something on that. So, um, you know, I'm I'm in the film industry. You know, Mike works in the film and music industry. And what people don't understand, sometimes they'll see me. I don't go to a lot of. Them. I get invited to a lot of events, a lot of events, secular events, um, a lot of red carpets. And I don't go to. I don't go to a lot. Like people, the actors in the film industry know I don't go to a lot. But when I do. I, I, I realize, and I know Mike realizes that he's called, and I've been called, to reach into Hollywood, to be a salt in a dark place, to be light in a dark place. And a lot of people don't understand that God will send certain people, because who's going to reach them? People always say Christians, and they're very negative. Look at these movies Hollywood's putting out, Hollywood's putting, you know, and Hollywood's doing this. But people like myself, Mike, others have been called in there to be prayed up, filled with the spirit, go in there and reach them. And because sometimes I, you know, I get a lot of flack and I know Mike, you know, is a lot more famous than I, he, he gets a lot of flack. So I'll end my statement with this. Mike was sharing a, a video one time and he was on a track, you know, on the track, there's different lanes in the track where people run. And Mike was just saying, and it really blessed me and ministered to me because he's saying, see, I'm in this lane right here. I'm in this, you know, the chalk on the track where you go around the track. He's like, I'm in this lane. And some guy came jogging by on the lane, the inside lane. And he, see, he goes, see, I'm not trying to get in his lane. I'm not trying to get in his lane. That's his lane. This is my lane. I'm just focused on my lane. In other words, I'm focused what God has me to do. I'm not worried what God has him to do or him to do. We all have a different calling. And I just really encourage you that, um, you know, when you see Mike or me or different Christians going into the the film world, it's not because we're compromised. It's because we know that we've been blessed with an open door to go in there and talk to these actors that no one may ever, may never get to minister to, but God called us to do it. So go ahead, Mike. Right, man. You know, and those are the dark places, man. And, you know, people would, you know, people are always going to talk, Paul, you know, people are always going to say things. And, but at the end of the day, man, it's just, you know, you answer to the Lord, you answer to God, you know, and I'm beyond in my life and in my walk with the Lord, I'm beyond um, trying to impress people, trying right. to um, listen to what people say. I know where I'm at with God and that's what matters at the end of the day, because when you answer before the Lord, it's just going to be you and God, man, you know, and, um, I used to be worried about what people thought. I used to be worried about um, what they thought about my attire, how I looked, how I sounded, what I did, you know, but I'm beyond that point now. It's just like, you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't bother me, you know, like yeah, somebody yeah. put a comment on Facebook or Instagram or, you know, and it was negative. So what? Delete it. You know what I mean? Move on. You know what I mean? It doesn't, it's not gonna, I'm not gonna lose sleep over it. You know what I mean? And, you know, because your purpose is way too bigger to um, allow people to influence your life. If you let people run all over you and, and let negativity, um, you know, overrun you, then you're allowing people that power to um, 
you know, make that decision for you, you know? Yeah, and I agree, man. And, and that all you people out there, be encouraged in that. Like when you're driving down the freeway, you see one of those signs off the freeway, you know, you go, you see it, but then you pass it. Before you know it, it's in, it's in the back of you. And, and just keep going, you know, don't stop. So, so tell us some of the movies you've been in. And, and who have you got to work with over the years? And, and I know Noel G blessed you, you know, you guys are good friends and, you know, what are some of the movies you got to be in? Um, let's see, I was in Rampart and Philly Brown. And then, um, um, I started like as an extra, you know, like Noel would get me these little parts and stuff like that, but I wanted to go further, you know, and people would say, Oh, I seen you in that movie for about two minutes or, you know, but, I, but it was a start, you know, with something yeah. because, you know, I truly believe you got to start somewhere. And it's not what you know in Hollywood, it's who you know, you know what I mean? And by me, just just jumping into these movies, these were movies, Paul, that made it to theaters. You know what I mean? I wasn't just like, you know, like doing some rinky dink movie that was shelved or, or collecting dust on a shelf. These were movies that went to theater. And I was just truly blessed. So, you know, I did Bullet with Danny Trejo, um, you know, I work with Danny. Um, I know Danny also, um, his roommate Mario was a good friend of mine. And, um, also, um, I worked on Fast and the Furious 7. Now, when we went to Fast and the Furious 7, Noel called me and he's like, Hey, Mike, I got, they're going to bring me back in the film, you know, like in the race wars. And so he goes, I want you to be a part of it. So I was like, cool, man, let's do it. You know, so I was excited, man. You know, like I'm standing, we're like, people don't know the, the man, what we go through on set, man, you know, and I'm sure, you know, but on Rampart, man, we were up to like five or six in the morning, freezing our butts off, man, freezing, we were freezing, man. And, um, but, uh, uh, Fast and the Furious 7, it was hot. It was in Lancaster. We're pouring sweat, man, like just dying out there. You know what I mean? For hours and hours. But, um, I got to meet Vin Diesel, which was a blessing, Vin you know, uh, walked up to us cause he knows Noel. So, you know, Noel introduced us and I got to meet Michelle Rodriguez and, um, just a blessing, man. Um, I got to meet Danny Trejo cause we filmed bullet and, um, um, you know, I've done a couple of things with Danny Trejo. He was also in my music video called praise on that I did with war. And, um, it was just a blessing, man, to meet all of these people, man, you know, and then I finally led, I finally got a starring role in this um, film called Kidnap Souls. Um, you know, I got a leading role and I uh, play a victim, you know, escapes and stuff like that. But um, it's been a good journey, man. It's been a good ride. God opened, opened up the door and God said, you know what? I'm just using this mic so that it will open up different doors and avenues for you. Um, and, and, and. something that people that can relate to, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So right now we just want to get him briefly into the Kilroy movie. So um, I I felt led to make a movie on um, Kilroy Roy Ball. He's one of the, you know, the founders of that big organization, the Gang of Gangs. And um, he was in that organization for, you know, 40, 40 plus years, man. He, he did more than 40 years in jail. And uh, he got released in 1993, 94, gave his life to the Lord. And now he dedicates his life to reaching gang members, pulling prostitutes out of their life, feeding the homeless. I mean, that's his call. He goes on mission trips to Africa. He goes into prisons. So we made a movie on him. And one of the people we casted, the lead role was Wilson Ramirez. But one of the people we casted to play one of the main roles in one of the areas of the film was uh, Second Chance, Mike. And he actually um, plays the part of Nico. And um, I don't want to say much on the role because uh, Nico was in that organization. He's a very well-known guy. You could Google him. But he, um, he gave his life to the Lord. And he paid the ultimate price of martyrdom. And actually, the part of Nico, he, so he died for his faith. But the part of Nico was actually... Kilroy is the one who said that Mike should play Nico. So it wasn't even me. It was Kilroy chose him to play Nico. He goes, he would be good for that role. And uh, we couldn't have done any better. So tell us about your experience on, 
on, on the set of Kilroy and um, dealing with uh, the stubborn producer like myself. <laughs> <laughs> man, you know, uh, it was a blessing, man, you know, for uh, Kilroy just to say, hey, you know what, let's get a second chance in there. And um, I think that he'll play the role. And, you know, um, I was honored, man, just to be a part of the film. And anytime there's opportunity to uh, minister through a message, you know, I'm, I'm all for it. You know what I mean? And being on set over there, man, it was it was a good time. You know, it's always a good time to film. And, um, you know, just uh, the parts that, that I was filming was, you know, um, it was deep, you know, it was deep. And um, but uh, it's always, always a blessing, man, to be able to operate in your passion, you know, and, you um, you know, to even see some of the, the places that we filmed that, man, you know, like it was special, you know, like um, to see like a, a, a movie set, you know, a prison cells or, yeah. you know, to to just all the guys being there having a good time. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, it, it's always a blast, man. I was honored and I just prayed that I did and, and lived up to the experience of the character Nico and um, I pray that um, you know the message is powerful and and his family is truly blessed you know and yeah. um, you know whatever um, whatever whoever is out there watching the, the film uh, I pray that uh, Yeah, so I pray that, you know, whoever's watching the film, you know, that God ministers to them, you know? Yeah, man, and and uh, we have been in contact. I think, Mike, you got contacted and I by um, Nico's son. So right. it's pretty cool that we got to represent Nico well and, um, you know, show that, um, you know, he paid the ultimate price, you know, mm -hmm. for, for living his face. But I also want to give props to Mike because Mike did help us um, with bring some people on the set he brought people out of from Arizona, uh, you know, who 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 rap with him, who were under his label, um, which they brought more people. He brought Sal Rodriguez uh, into the film. Sal played a part, actually, with me. I actually had to play a part in the film because uh, somebody kind of flaked on us and didn't show up, so I had to jump in and play his role, not by design. So I got to do a scene with Sal, and Sal killed it also, you know. So. Thank you, man, for all the help with the film. Not only that, making a song for the film with the message, you know, and, um, you know, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. And so that film is actually coming out. We're hoping Cinco de Mayo-ish, probably a week or two after Cinco de Mayo. We're going to have it at limited theaters here, hopefully in L.A. and Orange County. So we'll be keep following, you know, um, us and Mike and myself and more creative films and We'll, we'll keep you updated how to get tickets and that's coming very soon. So we'll have news probably by the end of, uh, the end of March, early April, we'll have news on that. So, so Mike, we want to, um, and all this time, you know, you, you're doing music, man. Tell us about all the places you got to go play music, but not only that, like all the hoods, man, you know, uh, man, I, I've been blessed, man. Um, Oh, man, I've been all over the country, man. I could say, you know, when I was with Brenton Wood, even not with Brenton Wood, I've got to travel a lot. And um, different countries, um, you know, uh, through the United States, um, you know, just it's been a blast, man. I, I, you know, when I first started flying, man, it was rough, bro. It was rough. I never been in a plane. I never got out of Artesia, bro. You know what I mean? And um you know, it was, I had a lot of anxiety, bro, and um, I would have little panic attacks on the plane, and I would get nervous, bro, really nervous, man, and uh, one day, God just said, you know what, there's nothing you can do, put your trust in me, um, and I started to get better, started to get better, you know, now I fall asleep on planes, bro, you know what I mean, and, um, but, uh, you know, I've been through, I've been through um, a lot, man, and, and just to see the places that I've seen, um uh, the 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 different places man it's just been an, an awesome journey um I, I just can't stop thanking the lord man it um i never thought that i would um you know make it this far be where i'm at today um at all man i just you know it's, it's just uh like the bible says all things are possible man all things are possible with god and um i know that my journey's not over yet um ah. 
you know, it's still, it's still rolling, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, man. So what's pretty cool, Mike, is um, one of the things of blessing is um, I'm pretty sure you performed here in my hood in La Habra before. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. In fact, I know you have because there was a play and, and, and I remember years back before I knew you. But one of the blessings is, bro, when God took you out of our tea show. And like Paul, he was set apart for a while. He had to learn and and become strong. You kind of did that with me, but then God places you back in because he wants you to reach. And you've been able to go back in Artesia and perform and preach the gospel at car shows, on stage and everything, man. But also, man, Artesia, you know, it really needs it because that area was filled with, you know, with a lot of big guys, you know, a lot of big guys, you know, and I know like, uh, you know, as far as like Weddle Buff, I know, I know you knew his sons and uh, stuff like that. Talk about growing up, you know, with people, all those people from status that came to your neighborhood, you know? I know there was Shark, yeah. there's different ones. Boxer yeah. there is, you know? You know a lot, of, a lot of history, man, in that neighborhood, you know, and um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of OGs, man, OGs, you know, the real deals. Um, you know, much respect and love out there to them. Um, yeah. Um, it's just a blessing, man, you know, to um, know that your neighborhood has history and legends like that, you know? And, you and, know, it's it's not, it's not guys that, uh, here's what it is. It's not that we're propping these guys up. It's because, you know, you even though God changes your life and you're not part of the hood, so to speak, you're not a gang member, you never lose your love for these people you have love for them they were your brothers growing up you know yeah so you know for people who don't understand but go ahead i'm sorry for cutting you off no it's okay though i mean man bro i mean dude that was just all in the family bro you know what i mean like artesia if if you understand like we're, we're like the homies the the brotherhood we were all like just one big family bro and um you know because artesia is a small city bro but we had a powerful impact bro mm -hmm. and um you know we would stick together bro you know like brothers you know what i mean and um everybody knew knew everybody bro everybody knows everybody bro somebody's having a party you know a barbecue at their pad you know like you, you're gonna know about it you know what i mean and me growing up with these guys man in this circle bro it was just um you know it, i you know with my dad and 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 my sister you know because chivas was um it was kind of it was it was a different clique of artesia you know what i mean and and to some people it was the same thing you know artesia chivas you know but um that was back then now it's just chivas you know they got their clicks or whatever but yeah, man. I mean, growing up with these guys, man, you know, we would just basically do, you know, we would die for them, man. You know, we would die um, for my brother, you know, and, yeah. um, you know, it was it was rough, man. And then, you know, having the, you know, those those type of people and that background, you know, because when you hear the city's name, Artesia, you know, what do people think right away? You know, they think of of, of whoever was um you know, uh, calling shots or, you know what I mean? Because there was a lot of shot callers, man, from Artesia. Big we shot call callers, them. too. Not, you know, big, you know, big, big impact guys, you know? Right, right. Um, and we I call them, the mills, you know, big guys. we call them the big homies, you know what I mean? Or, or, or you know, but um, growing up like that, man, I mean, I was a soldier for the devil, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, we would never back down, man. We weren't people that had hearts that would just um, back down or, or, you know, um, you know, if they did, somebody did something, you know, to us, we weren't just people who were just going to stand by, you know what I mean? I mean, you had homies that, you know, like it just wasn't in them, bro. You know what I mean? It just wasn't, you knew right away if, if you jumped them in that, you know, they, they were just lames, bro. You know, they were, they were just, they were scared you know what i mean but when you're like you know with me bro i was a kid i had a good heart man but the bible is true because when you hang with the foolish you're gonna become foolish and that's what happened to me bro i got corrupted 
my heart became from good to wicked. Um, I wasn't scared. If somebody disrespected me, bro, you were going to get it, bro. But you know what I mean? Cool. Ain't it cool all these years later? A while back, a while back, um, I see a flyer. And uh, I don't know where I, where I got this flyer. Second Chance is performing in Artesia. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Like how you get to go back now, bro, with a positive message and trying to pull the homies out. You know, right, give, right. Give them a new, a new way to go to saying, hey, you know, you knew me. God could change you, bro. But I want to talk something else now. Uh, another uh, uh, OG passed. Your dad, Mike, you know, mm -hmm. you know, um, you want to go into that and tell us uh, like how that affected you and, you know. Definitely, man. Like um, my pops was like my best friend, man. You know, like we grew up like he had my back, you know what I mean? And it was like when he died, man, and passed away, it was like a part of me died. You know what I mean? And but man, he had a big impact in my life, man. I always wanted to be like my dad, man. My dad was ruthless, bro. He was well respected. He was feared. Um, you know, when he walked in the room, bro, you knew that something was gonna take place, brother. You know what I mean? And um, you know, when he was around, you knew something was cracking, bro. And that's how his presence and his demeanor was. Um, you know, and, and I wanted to be like my dad, bro. You know what I mean? I wanted to, to follow in his footsteps. I wanted to be this, this, uh, gangster dude that was, you know, like, uh, well-respected bro, you know, and, uh, at his level. And, uh, I was trying to do my best, bro, you know, to make a name for myself or, you know, to, um, climb up the ranks, you know, like to be like my pops, you know, because he set the bar, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? He set the bar high. And when he was in prison, you know, he did 14 years straight, um, level four, you know, um, Corcoran, he was up there. And, um, but, you know, I wanted to be like him, bro. I wanted to make it to the, to the big time, you know, I wanted to put in, you know, enough work so that I can have a name or be respected, you know what I mean? And for me to go back to the neighborhood, bro, um, uh, to Artesia Park and, and see all the homies and, 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 and be there with the message, bro, of hope and that, and that God changed my life, you know, because when I gave my life to God, man, I said, you know what, God, uh, I was a soldier for the devil, but now I'm going to be a soldier for you. And, and, and I want to serve you, you know, no matter what happens, no matter how hard it is, I'm going to commit my life to you. And uh, that's what I did, man. And I went, you know, I, I went all out, man. And I went to Artesia Park and I seen a lot of the fellas, man, a lot of the homies, man, that I grew up with, they were there, man. I, I got to uh, get on that microphone and share the gift of music and my and and what God has done in my life. And you know, I, I really, you know, um, my heart goes out to them, man, because you know they respected it. You know what I mean? And there's not a lot of people that can go back to their neighborhood and still be respected. You yeah. know. And say, you know, uh, I know people are, you know, a lot of people are hiding or, you know, they're using God as an excuse or, you know, but I was honored, man. And I was privileged to go back there and be able to be respected and say, okay, Mike's coming, you know, with, to share his music or, or you know, to uh, share with us the message, you know. And uh, I remember I talked to one of my homies, man, and, um, and um, he ran with my pops. You know, it was uh, his road dog, man. And um, 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 it was uh, Weddle Buff's son, you know, Weddle Buff's son. Uh, and uh, one of them, and um, it was, uh, he was road dogs with my pops, you know, Big Mike. And um, I talked to him a while back, man, on the phone. And he was like, man, you know what, Mike, we're proud of you, man. We're proud of what you're doing. Keep up the good work. Um, you know, we know that uh, you're doing stuff with Brenton Wood and, you know, everybody. And uh, he just told me, man, much respect and love, man. And, you know, keep doing what you're doing, man. And I told him, man, thank you. You know, I'm praying for you guys, you know. And um, Sweet, I, really, I really appreciated that. You know what I mean? Yeah, man. And then um, about, your, about your pop's passing, man. I mean, I mean, tell us about that and what encouragement you could give the people who've gone through that, you know. Yeah, man, with my pops, man, see, my pops was a, he was a big drinker, man, you know, and, um, um, 
you know, God gave him many chances, many chances, man. And, um, but he loved to drink, you know, he loved that alcohol, man. And, um, you know, but uh, I just, you know, through my dad's life and, and passing, what I've learned, man, is that, um, you know, no matter how hard my dad was, like, you know, like, um, as far as like on the outside, he showed like a lot of love and respect, you know, and that's what I picked up, man, because my dad showed me, um, you know, how to uh, be a good man, how to be dedicated, how to respect people. And, um, you know, I love him for that, man. I love him for that, you know, because this generation nowadays, I could tell you, they have no respect. They have no respect. Um, the youngsters, they don't care, you know, who you are, what you do. You know, you can't even tell who's a gangster no more out there in the street. I mean, they're wearing, they're wearing skinny jeans and, and packing guns, you know what I mean? And yeah. it's just, you can't tell who, who's who anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but you know, if anybody that's out there watching this film or, or this video, I just want to encourage you, man, that, you know, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, no matter your situation, there's always hope. There's, there, you're never too old to change. You're not, you can't say like, hey, you know what, um, I'm too old for change, you know, because, you know, God has a plan, he has a purpose and a destiny for your life. And I truly believe that if God can do a miracle in mine, he can truly do one in yours. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 a good. As we're heading to the end of the interview, what a word of encouragement, man! And uh, and um, I have a few other things, Mike. But before we go on to those closing things, I want to do. Is there anything you want to share that I've missed? Man, you know, just um, man, you know, you guys are probably out there listening, you know, to my life story or some of the things that happened in my life. And it was just, that, that was just a little taste, you know what I mean? And, um, but, uh, you know, I've been close to death, um, on many, many occasions. And, um, I just like look at my life today and I, and, you know, I lift my hands up to the Lord because that's where my help comes from. And for those out there that, maybe looking down on somebody today. I want to encourage you, man. You know, we're not perfect people. Mm -hmm. um, we fall short every single day of our life. You know, um, we're far from perfect, but we are forgiven. And I want to encourage you that, um, you know, just pick yourself up, you know, keep going, keep moving, keep pushing forward, no matter what people say, you know, there's always going to be somebody that's going to hate on you or put you down. Um, or, or disagree with the vision and the dream that God has given to you. But you can't let that discourage you because if you do, then, you know, you, you're in the wrong game. You know, you're in the wrong, um, you're in the wrong, you're doing the wrong thing because in this thing that we do, you know, you have to expect that, you know, it, it comes with the territory, should I say. But like I said, I learned throughout the years, you know, to, um, not let that bother me it used to bother me so much when people would hate on me or say something about me but um i no longer lose sleep over it when you learn to um to do that then those people don't have control over you anymore you know what i mean and so um but to the homies out there if you're watching um you know much love and respect um you know i i, I never forget where i come from i never i always um i always um uh, mention where I'm from, um, the respect, the love that I have for the neighborhood. Um, uh, I love everybody that's there, man. And, um, you know, um, and, and to all those other people, man, that, you know, that don't know me and that tuned in, um, I pray that, um, you know, God truly really blesses you through this video. Yeah, man. And then, um, Mike, I have a couple of fun things before we close really quick. I All right. On for a while, probably longer than we planned, bro. But I'm sure the people are getting blessed, bro. That's all right. Yay. I know. I told Mike an hour we're probably going to go on two. But, <laughs> yeah, that, we, 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 when we turn this off, he's going to smack me or something. But, uh, do, Mike, give me the, the Mount Rushmore. Four people you would put on the Mount Rushmore. Rasa, rappers. 
Mount Rushmore? In your, it doesn't have to be everyone's, in your opinion, in your heart. Like, who blessed you? Who has blessed me? Yeah. Rappers? Rappers? It could be Christian, secular, whoever. Man, uh, Little Rob is one of them because, you know, Little Rob, um, you know, they say, a lot of people sound say that I sound like I'm more similar, you know, there's a little, <laughs> yeah, there's a little thing there, but uh, I listen to Little Rob, man, and he really influenced me, man, in a way to um, be a more artistic, you know, an artist uh, and, you know, my delivery, things like that. Um, you know, I, I really looked up to Rufus Troutman because of the talk box. Um, you know, just he amazes me and, and blesses me so much with his uh, style, his anointing, his music, uh, his message. Um, and um, uh, I could say um, uh, maybe uh, Smokey Robinson. Um, Smokey also has, um, you know, a, a gospel album also. And um, I just really love his message and, and um the smoothness of his vocals, you know? And um, of course I got to say Brenton Wood, man. Yeah. Um, Brenton Wood has um, not only been a friend to me, but uh, just a man that has given me an opportunity um, of a lifetime, you know, that, um, you know, he may not give to anyone else. And I really appreciate him. Um, you know, he was, uh, his music has, uh, you know, also, uh, touched people of many generations you know yeah and um you know uh, i got one more go ahead that's that's so that, go another one go another one man okay. oh man i love Basically, picking your brain. I, I think um i think um man, i would say that's about it off of my top of my top of my head you know yeah yeah, yeah. Man. and you know what even in the in the chicano christian rap i would put you and mc boulevard up there you know, oh, okay yeah yeah you guys, you guys are really reaching the world for christ man you guys both and man just uh just man thanks for keep thanks for doing that but uh, i got one more um i want you to do i'm gonna say a name and i want you to say not more than five words about them all right okay couple of names couple of names first thing that comes to your mind okay and you might know right. some of these you might not but i know you okay. know their names danny okay. trejo danny trejo ruthless MC Boulevard. Anointed. Kobe Bryant. Legend. Los Angeles Dodgers. Unbeatable. Emilio Rivera. Gangster. <laughs> Man, brother, is the last. No, I'm going to give you two more. Uh, Sonny Argonzoni. Oh, leader. 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 That's That's cool, man. And uh, last but not least, Jesus Christ. Oh, man. Over everything. Yeah. Yeah, man. So this is going to end the interview, everybody. Second chance, where can the people get a hold of you and what do you have coming? Please plug everything, bro. Man, uh, they could get a hold of me on Facebook. My Facebook is uh, Michael Robert Gonzalez Jr., um you know you could reach all my music on itunes just punch in second chance with the two nd chance uh second with the two nd and then chance the father's love all my albums will pull up on itunes spotify amazon xbox live everything um you know you could download some of my favorites there my albums uh even the album right here with brenton wood called lord hear my prayers on itunes um, you can find my stuff on YouTube under uh, Christian Rapper Second Chance. Um, you know, um, upcoming, we just did a video with um, Bone Thugs and Harmony, uh, music video coming out. Um, I got uh, working on some new music also and uh, got some upcoming films. And, and don't forget, Kilroy's coming out. So once you guys see that, um, hopefully we'll see you at the premiere. I'll be there. Paul will be there, and uh, we're excited to uh, to release this film. I'm I'm excited. I want to I want to be able to see that. Yeah, man, it's cool. And then so all those stuff he said, every all his uh, how to reach him and everything is going to be in the comment section below. So please look down there, and you can you can find it there. And uh, please support him. Go get uh, 
You can download some of his music. It's very professional, very awesome. You've seen some of the music videos, man. It doesn't get better than that, the quality. So we're going to close out this interview. You guys, thank you for visiting the More Creative Films page. Please subscribe, like, and share. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the support. Kilroy movie coming out in May. Follow us, you guys. Go to Instagram. Go to Facebook. Please give us a follow and a like. Follow Second Chance and all his social media. Share this video. Hit me up on Instagram. More Creative Films in the inbox. All right? And if we don't get to you, sorry, man. It's just uh, we'll let God, God lead us, man. But thank you for listening. Thank you, Mike, for the interview. We appreciate it. God bless. All right, brother. God bless you, bro.